Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to New Books in Medicine, one of the channels on the New Books Network. I'm Claire Clark, one of the hosts of the network. Today, I'm speaking with Sandro Galea, Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at the Boston University School of Public Health and the author of the new of the book Contagion Next Time, which is just out now from Oxford University Press. Dr. Galea, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I wonder if you could begin our interview by telling us a little bit about your career up until this point. And so I'm a physician originally by training. I, I was trained as a primary care and emergency physician. And uh, I practiced medicine in um, some pretty remote rural parts of the world. I was in northern Canada, I was in a place like Papua New Guinea and a place like Somalia. And while I was working in these places, I, I, I felt like I was well trained to be in fairly remote, the only doctor around often. And I hope and I felt like I was doing good work. But I became frustrated by the limits of what medicine could do and became frustrated with the fundamentally treating people once they were already sick. And I wanted to learn how could we keep people healthy to begin with. And I, I to do that, I realized I, I needed to start thinking about the health of the public, public health. And then I got, went on to get a doctorate in public health. And my academic career has been in public health. And throughout my, my academic career, I've written broadly about three things. I've written about the social causes of health, about how the world around us, where we live, where we work, where we play, shapes our health. I've had a fair bit of focus on mental health and things like depression, post-traumatic stress, and also on trauma, um, trauma in the world around us. So I think the theme to my academic career has been, I want to understand how we can build a world that generates health so we can actually all be healthy to get on with doing what we want to do. I've always seen health as a means, not the end, as a means for people to live a rich, full life. So I noticed that you were actually just on New Books Network last year to talk about your book, Well, What We Need to Talk About When We Talk About Health. Um, I wondered if you could tell us how you came to write The Contagion next time, because it's now here here we are a little over a year later, and um, you've got another book. Yeah, so so Well, uh, and I enjoyed that conversation too, was uh, perhaps a culmination of many years of work that um, really bringing a lot of my thoughts about these social forces that shape health into one place and putting them all into the book well. And then and the book was published in 2019, so before COVID, and then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I wrote some uh, a number of op-eds and various newspapers where early in COVID, this is like in March of 2020, where I said, look, understanding the role that these underlying forces play COVID is going to be a tragedy and it's going to be a tragedy that's going to affect us unevenly and it's going to hurt most the people who are most vulnerable, which was, of course, the, the, the part of the thesis of well. And then COVID happened and that's exactly what happened. So I, I in, in um, halfway through, through COVID, so it's halfway through 2020, I think out of frustration, I decided that uh, perhaps the best contribution I could make right now was to pause all other writing and just focus on writing in, in another book that uses the lens of COVID to illustrate why the tragedies of COVID were not so much viral tragedies. They were not so much about the virus. They were not so much about the infectious disease, but as much as about the world around us that resulted in unnecessary risk of getting COVID and unnecessary risk of severity of COVID and death from COVID when it happens. So really, I wanted to take a moment which I felt was going to be a, a teachable moment for all of us when we're all paying attention and to say, how do we now focus on the, on the forces that matter for health? I'd like to talk a little bit about how what you've written in this wonderful book relates to um, your work as your job as dean of the School of Public Health. So um, when I was in grad school, this was about a decade ago, I was I was getting my PhD in MPH, and um, there was a sense at that time that 
the, those of us in the United States were sort of living through an era of chronic disease rather than infectious disease. Everyone was talking about obesity. There was a lot of talk about o- o- the obesity epidemic at the time. And um, the movie Contagion had came out. And this was like a futuristic vision of the world, right? Mm-hmm. That could never happen to us. Um, so I, I wonder in what ways COVID-19 has sort of changed the way that you think about training public health workers. Yeah, I'm hoping that COVID-19 is a clarion call for public health and for the world. COVID-19 was a tragedy when you have 650,000 American lives lost, 4 million in, in, in the world. This is this tragedy, right? And, and there's no way of redeeming a tragedy, but at least we can learn from it and try to do better for next time. So I feel like what what's happening now is jockeying for the space of ideas to put in place the ideas that are going to shape how we restructure our world to prevent the next pandemic, the next contagion. And what I wanted to do with this book is to try to put out there with those ideas that it is not enough to focus on vaccine technology. It's not enough to focus on viral detection systems. It's not enough to focus on interoperable systems that allow public health to function. All of these things are important. This is not an or argument. But if we only do that, when the next pandemic hits, we are also still going to be vulnerable because fundamentally our unnecessary risk of contracting a pandemic is determined entirely by our ability to adopt non-pharmaceutical interventions, things like social distancing, and that depends entirely on whether we have stable housing and stable jobs. And our risk of dying from the pandemic depends entirely on our underlying physical health, and that depends entirely on our childhood, where we grew up, our level of education, our access to healthy food, and our access to exercise. So unless we change these underlying forces, we will remain, as I say at the beginning of um, the contagion next time, sitting ducks. I think we were sitting ducks for the terrible consequences of this pandemic. And I worry that we will remain sitting ducks unless we tackle these harder questions. So I want us to have the best possible, most rapid possible vaccine development for the next pandemic. I want us to have uh, sentinel viral detection systems, but I also would like us to take a long, hard look at these more fundamental issues that predispose us to unnecessary illness, unnecessary death. And I think we can. I think we can, and I think we should. Can you t- um, talk a little bit about what some of those issues are in in your view? Yeah, so let's take something very straightforward. Let's take the the black white gap in COVID mortality, which is now well documented. There has been a lot written about it in newspapers and in magazines, and uh, and I think you know most people who are well read recognize it. They know that more Black Americans died from COVID than the white Americans per population, of course. But it's fuzzy in people's minds why that is. So, so let's take it apart. Why is that? Well, it's, it is that way for two reasons. There was a differential risk of getting COVID, and then there was a differential risk of dying from COVID if you got COVID. So let's talk about each of them. Why was there a differential risk of getting COVID? Well, the differential risk for getting COVID is because how do people get COVID? People get COVID by being in contact with other people. And the people who are able to distance and to isolate and to work from home were the ones who are less likely to get COVID. Well, there is a very clear correlation between wealth and income and your ability to work from home and de facto protect yourself from an infectious disease. And I can show you graphs that show a linear correlation. So we have jobs structured in such a way that particular groups of people were able to distance and protect themselves and other groups were not. So African-Americans had a higher risk then of getting COVID. Now, how about getting sick from COVID? Well, getting sick from COVID, getting severe COVID is patterned on underlying diseases. And we know this. We knew this from February of 2020, from the early data from the China CDC, that having hypertension, obesity, um, um, any a number of other conditions, cardiac conditions, respiratory conditions, predisposed you to severe illness. And of course, that severe illness is patterned. It's patterned by wealth, by income, by race, by socioeconomic class. So as long as we have, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that as long as we continue to have underlying health inequities that are patterned on underlying asset inequities, 
we are going to have deep gaps, deep inequities, deep unevenness in death when a pandemic hits. So all of this at some level, at some level, should be obvious. And perhaps some people listening to this will say, well, this is obvious. And if it's obvious, that's a good thing because we want it to be obvious because we should say this is not acceptable and we should do something about it. It was, well, so it was certainly maybe not obvious to me, but in reading the book, it was, I I felt like I was the choir and you were sort of preaching to me. Like I was like, yeah, you know, yes, yes, absolutely. I agreed with everything. Um, but um, I imagine that there are people out there in the world, maybe some of them are even listeners to this podcast, who um, who might not agree or who um, might not under- or might not fully understand or appreciate why this sort of book link book length um, case for public health is necessary. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, the media coverage um, of COVID-19 has sort of brought to light some difficulties with public health messaging. Yeah, the, the obviously public health has been in the media like never before. Like the, the public health has achieved a level of prominence in the media that it has not had in, in decades, maybe even a century. So I do think it is a ripe opportunity for public health to set the record straight, so to speak, to make sure it tells the right story. It tells the story that the world should understand about the health of the public. And and, and I suppose that's in part what I'm trying to do. You know, I'll come back to, you said, well, some people may disagree. You know, it's interesting. I've, um, when I did my previous book, I talked about some of these themes with, um, with, by labels or conservative radio um, hosts and podcasts. And by and large, I find people do agree when it's explained this way because everybody fundamentally wants their children to be healthier. And in part, I think what I'm trying to do is to shift the conversation and to create ideas that ultimately nudge our political action. You know, there's a quote which I like from, of all people, from Milton Friedman, which, um, mm-hmm. as you and listener know, it's, it's often associated with sort of one of the spiritual um, uh, founding fathers of the modern right. And, and Friedman's quote is, um, you know, I believe our basic function is to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. And he was very, very good at that. I mean, he um, did a terrific job, really, of communicating his ideas at a time when uh, they were very much marginal ideas until they actually became politically inevitable. And, and I, I feel like that's the job of anybody who thinks. That's the job of anybody who, who's engaged in the business of um, getting ideas out in the public space. It's to propose alternatives to how we think, to keep those ideas alive until they become our inevitable conclusion. And, and one sees that time and time again with the adoption of ideas. And I, I suppose what I'm trying to do with this book is to say, okay, Let's make sure that these ideas are not forgotten in the mix, in the crush of noise that we have right now around COVID and in the crush of noise we're going to have to inject all sorts of money into curative approaches and neglecting once again to pause and say, but really, what was underlying the chaos that we just had? What was underlying? What was the root cause of the tragedy that was covid so um, part of the way that you do that to, to sort of keep ideas alive is through storytelling. Um, and the book uses a lot of anecdotes, a lot of different stories to kind of um, make your point about um, the root causes of public health and what can make us well and healthy and how um, sort of biomedical uh, quick fixes are, are not the solution. Um, I wondered if you could share one of those stories with us. What are the kinds of stories that we don't often hear um, in the mainstream media, that, but that we should? Yeah, so maybe I'll share one which I've used in, in a fair bit of my public speaking, but because I find it very helpful to explain the, the fundamental message of public health, and it's the story of the life of uh, Blind Willie Johnson. And Blind Willie Johnson, as some of your listeners will know, was a blues singer and um, remembered now for a few dozen of uh, blues songs he played that we still have recordings of. And he was born in Texas at the turn of the 20th century. 
and he was born sighted. And the story is that he lost his uh, vision when he was seven in a domestic violence incident. So he grew up poor and blind and black in Texas in the early 1900s. He got married and him and his wife were living in a small sort of hot shack and, and, and that, that burnt down. There was an accident burnt down, but they had so little money that they actually went back and they were living sort of in the burnt out husk of their original house. And in his early 40s, blind Willie Johnson got malaria. So this is Texas in the 1940s. And malaria was not unusual in Texas in the 1940s. In fact, uh, the CDC, for example, was initially started as a way of helping control malaria in the southern states. And his wife took him to hospital, and he was turned away from hospital, and then he died. Now, the reason I use that example is, is to ask audiences to say, well, what killed Blind Willie Johnson? And the answer as to what killed him is pretty clear. What killed Blind Willie Johnson was malaria. Had he received treatment for malaria, he would have lived. But of course, when I tell the story that way, it's clear that it was not just malaria, that it was also domestic violence and poverty and homelessness and poor access to care and racism that killed Blind Willie Johnson. So the, the, the point is that if we only invest our money in treatment of malaria, if we have the best possible treatment for malaria, we are still not going to solve the issue that many of us have all these other forces that conspire against us. And frankly, even if Blind Willie Johnson had treatment for malaria, something else would have killed him the next day or something else would have killed him the other day. And I find that when I tell that story, I have yet to have anybody who says to me, okay, I hear you, but we should only spend money on malaria. It, it, when, when, when I tell the story, I feel like everybody, of whatever political persuasion says, huh, okay, I get it, I get it. You're not saying we shouldn't spend money on malaria, which of course, that's not what I'm saying at all. Yes, we need treatment for malaria. But you're saying that we should actually take care of these other things that ultimately lead to us being sick to begin with. And that's exactly what I'm saying. And I think covid was just a perfect, terrible illustration of this, that yes, there was an infectious disease outbreak. Yes, vaccines have been an extraordinary, extraordinary triumph of science that are helping us get through this moment. But it's equally true that the challenge of the moment is because of the conditions that COVID found us in. And that's why the book is called The Contagion Next Time. It's, it's simply saying that I, I don't want the next pandemic to find us in these same conditions. So, um, but can, can public health really be um, apolitical if it is so um, dependent on or um, entwined with um, social, racial, and economic justice? If the case for public health yeah. is also a case for social, racial, and economic justice. I don't think public health should be apolitical. I think public health should be nonpartisan. Uh, and I think it's very important that public health is nonpartisan. I think it's, uh, but I don't think public health should be apolitical. I think in fact, public health has to be political. I mean, if you take the definition of politics, which is ultimately um, working collectively to figure out a resource allocation, I actually don't think that, uh, I, I don't think there is a meaningful public health without public health being pol political. Some, sometimes I joke sort of public health is, is all about Fundamentally, it's all about power and money because uh, that those are the forces in our society that shape where we invest in and that shape the structure of our world. You know, the, the, the title of the book, The Contagion Next Time, as I refer to in the book, is an homage to James Baldwin's great book in the two essays, The Fire Next Time. And uh, the it's a, it's a powerful book, really, about the consequences of racism and um he, in turn, got the phrase, the fire next time from an African-American spiritual. Um, um, and the, the, the idea, the notion behind the homage is simply to say that this is, was a powerful statement about one of the forces that ultimately shapes the world around us and something that's been with us for decades and centuries. And we keep seeing the effects of things like structural racism. And, and what I'm hoping through COVID is we say, it gives us one more reason why to say that should not be acceptable and we should do everything we can in our society to remove these pernicious influences. When, when you get to the book, um, it, the, the book also makes a kind of moral argument too. At the, by the very end, um, the book is concluding by discussing the importance of humility also in, in preventing the contagion next time. Um, 
the medical school where I teach, we've been having a lot of conversations lately about teaching things like cultural humility rather than cultural competency, structural humility in relation, in relation to social determinants of health. Um, why is humility key to informing our future conversations about health? Humility suggests that um, we do not know the answers and that we are open to learning and that we are open to answers that come from others. And I think humility is goes hand in glove then with compassion, with uh, a compassionate view of the world, a view of the world that says that uh, we are we want a better world for all and recognizing that to create a better world for all, even if there are people who are different than us, think differently than us, who we cannot even imagine being like, we cannot even empathize with, but we can be compassionate towards. Wanting a better world for all must require a sense that that's a hard thing to do and we require input from many and have the humility to know that and to act accordingly. And in part, I talk about that in the book because I worry about its converse, right? I worry about arrogance. I worry about the arrogance of our positions and the entrenchment of those positions. And I would argue that rigid approaches have led us down a path that makes us so vulnerable to something like um, COVID. So I, I think humility should inform how we act. And in part, I was talking also about the need for humility in science, because I think uh, science has shown itself during COVID, although it's always the case, to have strength and clarity of action informed by biases that it often does not examine. And to go back to my blind diligence on story, if you have a scientific machinery that's all built around treatment for malaria, you're not really going to pause and say, well, domestic violence was also a lead up to this cause of malaria. And humility should say, yes, we should be studying malaria, but let's pause and make, and see what else there is in the world around us that we should be tackling. Well, Dr. Galea, it is a, a wonderful book, a compelling book, um, a very convincing case for public health and for public health as um, intertwined and relying on um, issues of justice. Um, I, I, you, you've, you've written it, it's out. Um, I, maybe, maybe we hoped that the contagion would be over by the time the book w- came out, but it, it seems that we're still very much living with it. Um, what, what are you working on now? What is, what's next for you? Yes, I've, I've been working on a, on a really towards a, a book around turning the lens inward a little bit and thinking about public health, the practice and science of public health and about how we should be doing what we do. And, um, I've been casting it a little bit as an argument for a liberal public health. And by the word liberal, I don't mean the political sense. I actually mean it in the um, enlightenment tradition sense, where where does thinking about public health from a place of reason and reform, a data-informed approach, lead us to how we do what we do? So perhaps I'm, I'm turning a little bit inwardly after this book to say, Hopefully, I'm not getting these ideas out there. But uh, now, let me let me think a little bit about looking sort of closer to home and uh, how can we do better closer to home. So that's that's where my mind has been at, and I'm hoping to be able to develop this further in the next year. Well, that sounds like a wonderful project, and this will this will be a book as well. I I, I hope so. I'm just I'm just talking to an academic press right now. Wow, wonderful. Well, um, thank you, uh, Dr. Galea, for, for sharing your, um, your work with us and the New Books Network today. And I um, wish you all the best with the, the next project. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.